Okay. So, uh, first of all, do you have any questions so far? Okay. So, so let's just start our last session of uh, lecture. Uh, today is going to be our last session of lecturing, and then next session, which is next week, we will have a Q&A session. So in the next session, we'll review the, the course together. If you have any questions, uh, we'll go through your questions and try to answer them, and also, uh, you know, review the course together. So, uh, and so today I will also give you your assignment, your individual assignment, which is due by uh, two weeks from now. So you have two weeks to prepare this assignment and uh, send it in. So next session is your Q&A, and the week after is when you submit your assignment. So let's just start with international strategy. Uh, can everybody hear me? Does everybody hear me? Okay, awesome. Very good. So let's go ahead and start the class. Okay. So opportunities and outcomes of international strategy. So when, when it comes to international strategy, we have been talking about internal, external strategies. We've been talking about uh, different uh, parts of strategy of the company, inside the company and outside the company that all together will, uh, you know, show the strategy of the company overall. But we do also have the international strategy, and today we're going to, uh, you know, go over that. So opportunities and outcomes of the international strategy. First of all, identify international opportunities. So when it comes to uh, international strategy, first of all, we need to identify the international opportunities that are out there. So uh, companies utilize international strategy when they want to go global, when they want to go to other countries, and uh, that is normally the case when the companies want to grow, because uh, a lot of times companies are based in certain country, and but just relying on the the, con the consumers and customers of that certain region would not be enough if they intend to grow globally. So they do definitely uh, need to look into uh, expanding globally. So first of all, they need to identify the international opportunities that are out there that they want to tap. So the, the first point that comes to mind is the increased market size. So when you go international, the, the first benefit you get from that is that yeah, the, your market size increases. You have a bigger market size. Then you have return on investment. So uh, definitely when you invest and you go uh, international, you get a higher return because you, uh, you expand globally, you get a better, bigger market, you have more customers. So your rate of return actually increases because you are pretty much using the same resources plus the fact that you are probably uh, setting up uh, certain websites, certain branches in those countries, but uh, the idea of your production and everything is pretty much the same and you're going to pretty much copy that. Cert certain times you have to uh, basically add certain plans and strategies and marketing plans, but pretty much it's uh, the same that you were doing. It's just you are offering it in that other market as well. So, you, so your re return on investment actually increases. Then economies of scale. 
and also learning also increases because when you go in national then uh, you are uh, if you if you remember the concept of uh, economies of scale is that when you're producing more of a product your your uh, you know benefiting your your income that you get from it and the return you get from it actually increases because you have a certain amount of cost that you're required to pay in order to create a product. So after product number, let's say 200, you you get to the break even point where where you have actually earned the cost of producing your products. So from product number 200 and above, whatever you make is actually uh, just um, you know profit. So that's why the more you make, the cheaper it is for you, and you make more money. So when you go international, you, you increase your market size. You increase the chances of you getting only profit and uh, going above the break even point. Then advantage in location. So uh, location is actually also very important as you uh, probably remember uh, one of the strategies we, we talked about. Yes, sure. Uh, one of the strategies we talked about is location. So location of the company and location of the business is one of the most important factors in one's business. So, so advantage in location is when you go international, you're, you're using and utilizing the benefits of the location of that certain business that you're doing business with. So, so definitely you will benefit from expanding your locations and going to different uh, places, and that helps you to uh, you know enjoy the the benefit of more exposure to the market. Then the second column, we talk about exploring resources and capabilities. Uh, we, we talked about uh, resources and capabilities when it comes to inter internal and external strategy. So definitely we, we would use our uh, resources and capabilities. But in, uh, on the level of international strategy, uh, Can everybody hear me? Yeah, very good. So I, I believe those of you who cannot hear me is your 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 volume. Please please make sure you you put it at the max because I have increased my microphone uh, level to the highest and. Uh, I believe you should be hearing me pretty clear. So one of the things you've got to check is your computer and your speakers. Because I'm speaking pretty loud. <laughs> okay, so once again, exploring resources and capabilities in an international level is also very important when you want to go global because uh, as we discussed, for internal and external strategy, you definitely need and are required to uh, basically uh, utilize those. So, multi domestic strategy is something you got to use. Uh, basically, when we go international, we, we try to, to, to consider that global strategy, which means global and local. So multi-domestic strategy is, let's say when you go to certain country, let's say you're based in China, but you're going to, uh, let's say Europe and America. Uh, so basically there are certain countries that you're going to, let's say you're going to Europe, certain countries like Germany, Italy, Spain, and, and so on. So in every single market, let's say in Italy market, let's say in uh, Spain market, 
you will try to adapt to the local strategies of that certain region that you go to. So when you're going to Germany, you try to adapt that uh, domestic strategy for Germany. And then you go to Spain, you try to adapt and utilize the domestic strategy in Spain. And when you go to Canada, let's say, you try to adapt the domestic uh, strategies for Canada. So in a sense, you are adapting certain uh, domestic strategies of all those countries that you're going to. So basically, in a sense, you are just adapting multi-domestic or several domestic strategies one by one to for each and every single market you go to. And then we have the global strategy. For the global level is where you try to get to the universal strategies that mostly works for for everywhere. Wherever you go is pretty much the same kind of strategies that you need to, to use. And then transnational strategy is where where you go uh, it's like between national countries and uh, require those uh, strategies there are certain certain rules and regulations and uh, strategies that you got to adapt. So there are three levels. First is the global strategies of that certain region you go to, then the global which is universal, and then transnational is within those nations. When you want to go and expand, there are certain strategies that you adapt to, to, to basically uh, move along those countries and nations. And then finally, the last column is use of core competence. So basically, when when you want to do the core competence, you are exporting, licensing the strategic alliance and position, establishment of a new subsidiary. So when it comes to competence, you also need to utilize all these different sorts of strategies when, when you're required, when you, when you can find any need for it. So let's say you explore the product is one of the simplest and easiest way, ways of expanding globally. You just export the product from the, from the source country, from, from where your company is based to the destination. So let's say when you're going to Germany, you just export the product from here to Germany. But that not necessarily works all the time because it might be expensive. It might be a lot of uh, expenses regarding like the shipment and logistics might be very expensive. So sometimes companies use other types of strategies such as licensing. So licensing is when you try to uh, basically give licenses to some branches and stores that will do what you do or you will give them license in order to be able to render the services that you do or sell the products that you, uh, you are providing. And then a strategic alliance. Sometimes you find certain uh, companies in your destination country or market or region and then you try to come up with a strategic alliance that you work together. Then acquisition is when you basically try to acquire and buy uh, another company in your destination country or region or market. In that way, you're actually expanding your exposure by the help of that, that other company that you're acquiring. And then finally, establishing a new subsidiary. It's just you're establishing a new branch in that certain market and that way you will also try to expand. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, beautiful. So let's go to the next slide. So, so let's say when we are, this is the last column we just talked about. So when, when we do exporting, licensing, strategic alliance, acquisition, establishment on new uh, subsidiary, there are, there are certain problems and risks that we will face. So there are management problems and risks. 
that you face while doing those. So in order to to surmount those challenges, you got to provide better performance and then innovate. So by innovation and better performance, you try to to solve those problems and those risks that you face. So uh, the better performance is really important because you're competing with the local markets in that region that you're going to. So you got to make sure your performance are are at least uh, at par with those uh, local uh, companies and and you got to exceed those performance because you are competing with the local companies and you need to uh, argue why customers in that market should come and buy your product rather than just continuing uh, buying and purchasing uh, products from the, the local companies. So there, sh there should be a benefit for uh, the, the customers to come and purchase your product and use your services rather than just continue what they were doing. So the only the only excuse, the only argument that you could have is that you would you would have better performance. You would have better products or services offered by your company. So that will make sense to the buyer. You can't just expect the customer can um, come and buy your product with the same price with the same quality and because you are just new. I mean, it's actually more difficult because customers uh, will probably rather continue doing what they were doing rather than just uh, change into uh, your, uh, you know, right, change to your, your products and services. So that is really important. Uh, a lot of times the, the international company that expand are pretty well known. Let's say when McDonald's wants to go and expand into a new market, uh, they don't need that much of marketing because uh, people know McDonald's or a lot of other, like Sony, when they want to expand into a new market, they are, they are already known by, by the customers. But, <clears throat> but even that, customers, uh, need to realize that uh, you have entered that market. You have to let them know that you exist. So that uh, awareness level is really important. So, and then uh, you set your standard, and the customers feel uh, comfortable with purchasing your product rather than the local market. So definitely, better performance is is an issue that you got to consider when you're expanding globally. And then innovation. I mean, uh, a lot of times your resources that you have is pretty much limited. And all the companies that are doing the same thing and you want to compete and provide better performance are, are using the same sort of, uh, resources, sometimes better resources because you're, let's say, a foreign company, because you're go growing internationally, you're just entering that market, uh, and it's going to be more difficult for you. To, uh, to basically provide services or products with uh, better performance, which uh, is worth the customer while, uh, and it's, uh, it's something that you got, they, they will consider. So the, one of the best solutions to that is innovation. Innovation helps you to come up with new ideas and innovative ideas and innovative strategies or methods to basically save on cost, uh, create better performance, better better services, and in that way, you basically you can beat the competition and you know uh, be the better company. So one of the ways that um, Google basically uh, became successful was by innovation. I mean, they were competing against uh, the the giant company Microsoft which seemed unreal and uh, impossible. But what they decided to do was to, to innovate, and by innovation, they, they managed to, uh, you know, beat the competition and be, uh, be better, uh, I mean, perform better. Okay, any questions so far?
Any comments or questions? So uh, motivations for international expansion, you have increasing the market share, we just talked about it, so your domestic market may lack the size to support efficient scale of manufacturing facilities. So you might have certain facilities that could cover a lot more than your local market. So one of the reasons that you want to uh, go to international uh, market is to increase your market share. And then the next is return on investment. So basically large investment projects may require global markets to justify the capital outlays. So uh, basically uh, large investment projects will, will basically uh, justify your growth because you have already spent a lot of money on let's say certain project and you have achieved certain uh, results and just just tapping the local market would not be enough for you to basically uh, you know maximize your profit or or basically use what you have achieved your your your, your potential for the profit uh, is way more than just doing the local market so then it makes sense for you to go to the international or a return on investment. And then the patent protection in some countries implies that firms should expand overseas rapidly in order to preempt new initiatives. This is very, very important. It has happened a lot. Uh, a lot of companies, uh, they basically realize in their, in their own country or their home country, uh, the, the, the patent rules are not that strict or they're not enforced. So let's say you come up with an innovative idea, you come up with a great idea, and then when you want to utilize it in your own country, everybody is going to copy it. You can't patent it. So that's when people come and go to uh, countries where they do have patent and copyright, and by registering it there, they actually make the main, the, the main uh, profit rather than just staying where they were. And then there, were, there would be companies overseas getting your idea and then registering it over there. So it really makes sense for you to try to, uh, you know, uh, expand when you don't have any copyright uh, where you are. And by registering in that certain country that they do have patent, you actually make the main uh, profit. Okay. So continuing that concept of motivation for international expansions, then we have economies, economies of scale or learning. We talked about it, expanding size or scope of markets helps to achieve economies of scale in manufacturing as well as marketing and art, research and development or distribution. So by expanding your size, by going to international uh, you know, countries, by, by adding to your market, you actually benefit from uh, economies of scale in, in manufacturing as well as marketing. I mean, you can use the same marketing techniques, you can use the same marketing resources, I mean, you just use them in a different market. So while you have already uh, spent money on creating those materials, you might as well use them in different markets. And then the R&D or distribution will also, uh, you, ha you can save on them. So if you remember, if you start from scratch, your R&D department needs to uh, do research and get everything ready for you to, to, to get to the production level. Uh, and that is going to be costly for you. But when you have done your research and you have everything ready, so you, you can just use those outcomes, those research outcomes, and use them in different markets. So you don't have to do all the research again because you have already done it. You just use those in different markets. 
then you can spread the cost over a larger sales base. Same concept that we talked about. You have the same cost. Uh, I mean, there would be an additional cost, but it's, it's going to be minor to the overall cost of your production. So your sales is going to expand. So instead of just selling to a certain market, to a certain number of clients, you multiply your sales by going to different different markets and sell them. And then increase the profit per unit. That is also increased because as I mentioned, when you break even, whatever product that you sell uh, uh, in addition to the, to the last number of products required to be sold, in order to, for you to make break even. So that's going to be profit. So the higher it is, the higher profit is you're going to make. And then the location advantages, you have the low cost markets may aid in developing competitive advantage and you may achieve better access to raw materials, lower cost labor, key up customers and energy. So all these are, are pretty important. Let's say um, a lot of companies are going to countries where they can benefit from uh, lower co labor costs and then uh, lower costs for raw materials. They have more access to raw materials. They have more customers or they can use better energy. So all these is going to help you to, you know, uh, make more profit and be more successful. So as you can see here in this chart, we have international corporate level strategy, and then we have uh, uh, two basically sides. One is need for global integration, and one is for local responsiveness. As you can see, for a global strategy, when you're just going global, your global integration is at the highest. So you don't need to necessarily uh, be that much responsive or as much responsive as others when it, when it comes to uh, global integration. I mean global strategy, uh, you just focus on your global integration. So that's at the highest level. But when you have transnational strategy that we just talked about, transnational strategy is when you're going from one country to another, it's like uh, your, your strategies among the countries that you're expanding. You need to be lo lo uh, locally responsive and globally integrated. So one of the good examples of transnational strategy is McDonald's. They try to adapt their, their, their strategies according to the local needs as well as the global integration. Let's say McDonald's, uh, they, they use certain uh, preferences and add that as local preferences to their McDonald's. So if you ever go to McDonald's in Malaysia, let's say, there they serve something called bubur ayam, which is rice and chicken, and it's like a soup, it's like a chicken porridge, you know. So that's not something they would serve in like a regular market, but they are serving that to Malaysian market because that's the preference of that certain market. Or they add chili sauce, which is uh, not common in other countries, but it's very common in Malaysia. So that's a local response. But globally, they have very similar standards uh, wherever they go. And then multi-domestic strategy, we talked about that, and we said, like, in every single country or market you go, you, you got to adapt a certain level of preferences they have. So that's when you're just focusing on local responsiveness and not much of global integration. So as you can see, multi-domestic and global strategy are two uh, extremes. On global strategy, you're just focusing on uh, global integration. And on multi-domestic uh, strategy, you're just focusing on local responsiveness, but transnational strategy is something in between where both of them are high. You, you try to be as high on global integration as much as uh, local responsiveness. Okay? Is it clear so far?
field. So international corporate level strategy, type of corporate level strategy, type of uh, corporate strategy selected will have an impact on the selection and implementation of the business level strategy. So uh, basically uh, the type of uh, corporate strategy that you select will influence the selection and implementation of business level strategies. So these are interrelated. The type of corporate strategy that you choose is very important and its impact is going to have a lot of influences on your business level strategies. Some corporate strategies provide individual country units with flexibility to choose their own strategy. So sometimes uh, as your corporate strategy you gives flexibility to uh, other countries and let's say you're expanding to other markets in different countries, you give them flexibility that they can change and adapt. And others dictate business level strategies from home office and coordinate resource sharing and crossing. Sometimes uh, companies they just base their strategies at their home office and those are the offices that dictate the strategy uh, all over the country. So it's pretty much, uh, not only the country, but all over the world, they are pretty much the same. So it's just the approach that you have for your company. Sometimes you rather uh, give flexibility to your other branches in overseas for them to be able to adapt to the needs of the market. Or sometimes you think it's best to standardize and just, uh, you know, uh, publish and uh, tell them exactly what they are required to do from your home office. So inter international corporate level strategy, multi uh, domestic strategy is a strategy and uh, operating decisions are decentralized to strategic business units in each country. So in multi-domestic strategy, you are trying to decentralize every single business unit. So every strategic business unit is going to be decentralized. And then your products and services are tailored to local markets. So you try to tailor every single product and service according to the uh, you know local market that you're going to. And then business units in one country are independent of each other. So, so basically the business units that we have are different from each other. They are not dependent on each other. And then the soon markets uh, differ by country or region. So you, you're assuming that by going from one country to another, uh, they are actually different. And then prominent strategy among European firms due to broad uh, variety of cultures and markets in Europe. So there are, there are certain strategies among European firms uh, because there are, there are different cultures there. So you believe in that type of strategy, which is multi-domestic strategy. You think that every culture and country has its own preferences. Then the global strategy, when it comes to global strategy, your products are standardized across uh, national markets. And then uh, decisions regarding business level strategy are centralized in, in the home office. So uh, basically, uh, you try to standardize when it comes to global strategy. You try to just uh, standardize whatever you do so that it's pretty much the same everywhere you go. And decisions regarding business level strategies are centralized in the home office. So the home office is where they publish all the strategies wherever you go and all along the uh, company, uh, either at, at the home branch or at the uh, other country. And then emphasize on economies of scale because global strategy gives you the uh, chance to utilize the economies of the scale and then uh, uh, 
uh, often lacks responses is the local one. So as we discussed, for global strategy, you're considering and presuming that uh, everywhere is the same as long as you have the international uh, strategies, uh, it's, it's enough. So you're not as responsive to local preferences as other types of strategies. And then you require, it requires resources, sharing, and coordination across borders. Uh, so, so for global strategy, you have to be able to uh, share the resources and coordinate across borders because you are basically basing everything at the home branch and you're just globalizing, you're just expanding globally. And then the transnational, you seek to achieve both global efficiency and local responsiveness. So basically, uh, you try to be efficient in the global level and then uh, locally you want to be responsible. So transnational strategy is a hybrid approach which you have both of them, which is the uh, global uh, side and international side and then the local responsiveness at the highest both at the same time. Then it's difficult to achieve because of simultaneous requirements which is a strong central control and coordination to achieve efficiency and then decentralization to achieve local markets responsiveness. So at the same time, you're doing both of these together, which are pretty much different or sometimes contradictory with each other. So that's why it makes it difficult to at the same time, first of all, uh, be uh, centrally controlled and coordinated and at the same time decentralize yourself. So it's like doing two different things at the same time, which is kind of difficult. And then finally, you must pursue organizational learning which you competitive advantage. So you need to, to focus and rely on organizational learning. So learning in this, in this type is pretty much important because you have to adapt to uh, local preferences pretty fast. So you have to be uh, learning fast and respond very fast. At the same time, you got to utilize and share your international uh, achievements and learnings. So a lot of a lot of uh, you know learning and development is involved. Okay. So that is it for the international uh, uh, level of strategy. Are there any questions so far? Any comments or questions? So uh, I want to talk a bit about outsourcing. We have covered it before a bit, but I want to, uh, you know, just refocus on it again. So uh, by outsourcing is the purchase of value creating activity from an external supplier. So outsourcing is when you purchase a value creating activity which is part of your value chain from another supplier, which is an ex ex external supplier. So few organizations uh, process the resources and capabilities required to achieve competitive superior superiority in all primary supply activities. So there are few organizations that uh, they process the resources and capabilities that are required to achieve that competitive superiority. So you only outsource those resources, I mean those uh, value creating activities that are, uh, that are not common and they are not unique to your, your, your company. And by forming and emphasizing fewer capabilities, a firm can concentrate on those areas in which they can create value and specifically suppliers can perform outsource capabilities more. So basically outsourcing happens when you are uh, taking one activity which is not that uh, essential and uh, important to your company and by giving it to another company uh, that is focusing on that, you get a chance to focus on those activities that you think are more important to your company. 
So let's say when you are when you are producing shoes, okay. So by producing shoes, uh, you might be uh, making some of the uh, you know raw materials, you know, like the plastic or whatever is required to make the shoes uh, in your company. Well, you can decide to buy that and outsource that certain uh, you know type of thing that you create from another company that are focused only on, let's say, create shoelace, and when you buy that, you just you focus on the whole shoe and creating the shoe as a whole, right, and just focusing on creating a lace as well. So, so by doing that, you save time, you save energy, you, you get more efficient, and you, you can save some money and cost and focus on your major value creating activities. So that's when you do outsourcing. So it's strategic rationales for outsourcing. There are basically certain arguments and rationales when you do outsourcing. So first of all, you improve your business focus. It lets your company to focus on a broader business issue by having outside experts handle various uh, operational details. So by improving your business focus, uh, you 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 get a chance to focus on broader business issues, and uh, experts from outside handle operational details. So so you're actually getting help in a certain way that in certain area that you don't want to focus, you you get others involved and you get a get a chance to focus on what you want to do uh, like most. Then provide access to world-class capability. The, the, the specialized resources of outsourcing providers makes world-class capabilities available uh, to firms in wide range and uh, of application. So basically, when you're outsourcing and uh, you know uh, using somebody else's skill set, you you add to your capabilities. Because you're using somebody else's capability, and uh, you know uh, that becomes available to you. Let's say you the, the shoe example. You might be a great shoe producer, but you might not be a great shoelace producer. But there might be better shoelace producers. So by outsourcing that, when you get those shoelaces and you focus on your other uh, you know details of the shoe. You are improving the quality of that shoe that you're making. So, first of all, you, you save time and probably cost because you are you're not focusing on something that is not the main part of the shoe. At the same time, uh, you 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 get you you basically have access on the production of a better uh, producer which is focused on the shoe legs and then you focus on your shoe. So that's how you benefit from it. Then you accelerate business re-engineering benefits. So achieve uh, re-engineering benefits more quickly by having outside outsiders who have already achieved world class standards take over process. So you are basically re-engineering, regrouping, and recategorizing your benefits, and uh, outsiders are helping you in that sense. Then sharing the risk, so you reduce the investment requirements and make more flexible, dynamic, and better able to adapt to changing opportunities. So you are, in a sense, increasing your your uh, benefits by reducing the risk of investment because you are investing less on something that you are, you should not be focusing, and then freeze uh, freeze resources for other purposes. So by redirecting efforts from non-core activities toward those that serve customers more effectively. 
So you you gotta keep in mind that you by resourcing you are just resourcing those activities that are not core activities. So these are not activities that are bringing your competitive advantage. Let's say if you're you're the best producer of uh, let's say uh, certain uh, hardware of computer uh, when it comes to production of the the whole computer, you're not gonna outsource those competitive advantages that you have because that's going to make you lose business. You only outsource those stuff that are not core activities of your, your company. You only outsource those that are less important that you, uh, you can just, by outsourcing them, you, you don't lose anything. You actually gain time and you, you reduce the cost so you make more money. Okay? So there are issues when it comes to outsourcing. So greatest issues is one, one is outsource only uh, to firms processing your core competence in terms of performing the primary or support the outsourced activity. So So basically, uh, the greatest value you get from outsourcing is when you uh, outsource only first processing a core companies in terms of performing the primary support. So, so when it comes to outsourcing, as I mentioned, you try to only outsource the non-core activity, and it's when it's only a matter of processing, you know. Uh, so the core competence, you just keep it as your primary activity, and you're just outsourcing the supporting activity side, you know. So let's say the materials that you need for shipping those, yeah, sharing risk. Uh, the example of sharing risk is that. Uh, when you are investing on on something that is not your core activity, let's say back into the shoe example, when you are creating the shoelace, you you are basically investing and taking the risk on investment for the shoelace, right? But when you involve another producer, another provider for the shoelace, you are actually sharing the risk of investment because you are bringing in somebody else's investment in. So you're not the only one that is uh, investing on that shoe because one part of it is coming from another provider and in a sense you're, you're sharing the risk. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, so I guess you got your answer. Uh, okay, so uh, going back to uh, this slide, evaluating resources and capabilities. So when there are things that you should not do when you do outsourcing. So you evaluate resources and capabilities. Do not outsource the theory to reach the firm itself can create and capture value. So when we talk about outsourcing, you are not to outsource those activities that you yourself can create value and be competitive. So you're only outsourcing those stuff that uh, you, by utilizing somebody else's uh, services, you are actually going to benefit. Then environmental threats and ongoing tasks. Do not outsource primary and support activities that are used to neutralize environment threats or to complete uh, necessary ongoing organizational tasks. So, so we do not outsource those uh, uh, those activities that are to neutralize the environmental threat. Those environmental activities are mostly what you do yourself. You try to 
focusing on, on, on focus on them yourself rather than outsourcing them. And then non-strategic team of resources. Do not outsource capabilities that are critical to the firm's success, even though the capabilities are not actual source of competitive advantage. So there are certain activities or capabilities that are the, the source of uh, your success. So you would not be outsourcing those because those are giving you the competitive uh, Competitive advantage. And those are critical parts of your your business. And then the knowledge. Do not outsource uh, development of new capabilities and uh, competencies. So you basically don't outsource those parts that brings in new capabilities into your company. You try to be the source of new capabilities yourself rather than outsourcing them. So there are cautions and reminders. So first of all, never take for granted the core competencies will continue to provide a source of competitive advantage. So the core competencies is something that you never take for granted. You always try to focus on it. All core competencies have the potential to become core uh, rigidities. So you, you need to understand that your core uh, competencies can bring in a lot of benefits to you. So a lot of times when co companies think, take for granted their core competencies and they start outsourcing them or they just stop uh, researching about them and uh, continually improve, they, they lose on, uh, on them and they, they can't sustain that. So it's very important to understand that and keep on working on your core competencies. Then uh, these core rigidities are former core competencies that are now generating interior and strifle innovation. So these, uh, when your core competencies, when you work on them and you make them better, they become core rigidities and these are uh, the source of your innovation. And then finally, uh, determining what the firm can do through continuous and effective analysis of its uh, internal environment increases the likelihood of long-term competitive success. So by focusing and uh, effectively analyzing the internal environment, you'll achieve competitive success. Okay, so any questions so far? Any comments or questions? Okay. So your task is Okay, so your task is please explain how each of global strategies multi domestic. and transnational give an example for each and explain Okay, so this is your task. First of all, I want you to re-explain what we explained, the 
the differences between global strategy, transnational strategy, and market domestic strategy. So what is the difference? And then give some examples. Give an example of a global strategy, in transnational strategy, and multi domestic strategy. And then finally, what strategy is used for your own company, your NGO, your government, whatever, wherever you work, what type of strategies do you use? So please explain that. So I give you a few minutes, maybe five, ten minutes to work on that, and then we start discussing it together. Okay, is that clear? Any questions on the task? Okay, so please start working on it.
Okay, so let's see your answers. Uh, so this is only a global strategy says for the entire world and transnational strategy says for some. Uh, Yeah, so global strategy, uh, we'll, we'll explain when we get others' answers also. So who wants to go next? Who wants to explain next? Okay, would you like to... I explain Mr. Saburi uh, of the differences. And please give a give an example of each of them. For example, I mean what uh, give an example of a domestic and multi uh I mean, like global, multi domestic, and international. Okay. So, who wants to explain? Who else wants to uh, give us uh, his or her answer? Okay, good. Okay. Does anybody else wants to share uh, your answers? Okay. We have Mr. Amazai's. So multinational companies, as mentioned uh, at the top, have. Uh, Base corporation or factories in their own country and some other branches in other countries as well. Home based company.
Multi-dimensional strategy and multi-dimensional standards. Yeah, very good, very good. Uh, yeah, as you as you mentioned, the global strategy is when you have standardized strategies. So you globally are integrated. All your branches are integrated with each other, and basically your home branch uh, is the one who decides what to do, and all along the company, all over the world, it's going to be the same. And multi-domestic strategy, though, in every single branch, in every single region, they have their own decision-making department, and so it's uh, it could be totally different from uh, one branch to another. And then transnational strategy is where you basically uh, have the home branch making certain decisions and certain level of globalization and internationalization. But at the same time, each branch is given some decision-making, uh, you know, choices, and they can make decisions if they need be. And uh, examples is, like, for global strategy, companies such as HP or, let's say, uh, you know, Dell are pretty much the same standards. Wherever you go, it's pretty much the same functions, the same features, the same way of, uh, you know, sales and all that. Uh, so they have pretty much standardized global strategy. When it comes to multi-domestic strategy, for, for Dell, for example, they do have some multi-domestic strategy as well. And that is when they let their, uh, I mean, Dell is basically non-retail computer. You're, you're supposed to choose online what you want and then order it. But at certain countries, Dell will have a certain shop letting customers go and buy at the shop. So that's according to that domestic preference. And then transnational strategy, an example, would be uh, companies such as multiple uh, companies nowadays, they have a hybrid approach, like even McDonald's, as you mentioned. Sometimes they give choices for certain menus, certain cu cultures don't, don't like certain type of meat or whatever, and then they, they do have this type of, uh, uh, you know, decision making possible. At the same time, they have the global, uh, you know, standardization. Okay. So that's for the assignment. Let me just go ahead and show you your your final task. This would be due in two weeks' time. Okay, as you can see here, as you can see here, we have strategic management individual project. So write an executive summary of what you learn in the course and how you're going to apply it to your career. So the requirements, you should should be no more than 10 pages. You need to use practical and real applications and imaginary and fake data is not acceptable. Assignments are due by the last session. So the last session will be two weeks from now, which is, if I want to tell you the exact day, it would be,
on 23rd. So 23rd of December. Yeah, I will email you also. So 23rd of December. Okay, so uh, so basically, what I re require you to write for me is how you're gonna utilize all these concepts that we talked about in business strategy in your uh, career. So uh, I rather practical, real examples. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll email you the same the same thing with the date, which is 23rd of December. So, so it will be due by 23rd of December. I'm sorry, uh, September. September. I meant September, but I said December. Twenty third, third of September. December, December is wrong. September. I mean the same month as the earnings. Twenty third of September. Yeah, twenty third of September, uh, which is two weeks from now. And uh, please uh, make sure that you use practical examples, uh, real examples about your own career uh, so that it makes it more uh, realistic. Okay. Any questions? Okay, uh, so next week uh, we will have a Q&A session. Uh, it's probably shorter than our regular sessions, but bring in all your questions, what, whichever part of the course that you have questions, you want to review, uh, you know, whatever you want, uh, re-explanation of the stuff that we talked about, we will cover next week. So it's a Q&A session for you to bring in all your questions and if you have any questions regarding the assignment or if you have any questions about, regarding business strategy or whichever concept of business strategy, we'll, we'll cover that next session. Okay? Beautiful. So, so with that, we can finish the session today. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, attending the business strategy class through the semester. I hope you benefited from the class and you are able to utilize all these concepts in, into your uh, business career. And it was a pleasure uh, being with you during this course and I look forward to seeing you again in the next courses offered by Worldwide Science for your MBA uh, degree. Thank you so much, everyone, and I'll see you next week in our Q&A session. You too.